and I'm going to talk about it a little bit during, but Steve Gordon, sitting Steve there, is going to have a talk after this about HTTP Client Factory, which ties in with me. So I've got two slides, or two or three slides on HTTP Client Factory, and Steve, have, have you have more on how to? Okay. Let's see, we have a full discussion on HTTP Client Factory. You're in room four. Is that this level? Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm going to say it is 4.20, and I will start. So thank you very much for coming, everyone. My name is Brian Hogan, and that's been up for a while. So a tiny little bit about me to start off. I've been working in .NET since about 2004, but I started a blog a little, maybe about five years ago. I blog about a lot of things like microservices, um, Web API, Entity Framework, and of course, quite a few things on Poly. I started a podcast, I think in 2014, and it's mainly around the .NET world, C Sharp microservices, but I do I reach out to things like repetitive strain injury, salary negotiation, quantum computing, as long as it has something to do with the, the tech sector. And I have a Pluralsight course on Poly that you can look up. I updated it this year with HTTP Client Factory because that was quite an important improvement or quite an important uh, change. But why we are here is because things go wrong. We all suffer failures in our software or someone else's. And most of our applications rely on connectivity at this stage. I mean, I, I haven't worked on an application that doesn't have some outbound communication for a very long time. But we know that connectivity has never, ever been guaranteed. We have to deal now, of course, with not only the local network, but with the broader internet and the vagaries of what happens there. And of course, we have software that fails that isn't uh, under our control. So the question becomes, you know, what will your application do? Will you throw up a yellow screen at desk or something else? In some cases, you may well be okay with a single fault like this. Maybe you can, your application can recover. Maybe you can move on. Or maybe faults will bring down your whole application. What you can do about it, so this gentleman over here and I were chatting before we started, and I've talked with some people about what you could do by hand. You would do some form of retry. That's the most logical thing. You've got a failure, I'm going to retry. And um, for the people who came in a little bit late, I asked who's using Poly, and a few people are, and most are doing it for retries. So if you have a local system and a remote system, you send your request, you get failure, some sort of failure along the way. You then do a retry, and retry, and retry up to some reasonable number of times, hoping to get a response. Now, implementing this is not the easiest thing. So I've asked people at conferences or at little uh, meetups, you know, how would you do it by hand? And this is a general approach. You'd have your HTTP clients making a request to some remote endpoint. You'd throw a for loop around it you know, because you want to do it at least three or four times. Great, that's fine. You'd have to have a try catch because you, it, you might not get, you may get an exception as much as you'd get a, a, a bad status. And then of course you have to break out of it if it works. Now, that's the kind of code I have seen once or twice, but it's very fragile, it's very hard to reuse, it's very hard to change, and of course hard to customize, and I wouldn't advocate for this. I, of course, advocate for Poly. So Poly is a resilience framework, and if you're using Microsoft, it's pretty much the only game in town at the moment. If you've worked in the Java world, you may have heard of Hysterix. Poly and Hysterix have overlapping features. Poly has some things that Hysterix does not have, and Hysterix has a few things that Poly doesn't have. So Poly helps protect your application from failure, but it has a knock-on effect on downstream applications, and also on upstream applications. Poly, um, as we were talking about, it has a bunch of things that allow for retries, circuit breakers, uh, caching, fallback, and a few more. I'm going to go through them all as we move on. It was started in 
2013 by a gentleman named Michael Wolfenden, but more recently it's been taken over by Dylan Reisenberger, part of the App V Next group. So Dylan is active on blogs, Slack, uh, Twitter, and he's been on my podcast and also the .NET Rocks podcast. I'm going to show a little bit of code. So this first piece I'm going to show you is pre-.NET Core 2.1. This is how uh, a policy would look when you're using it to protect a request. So I have the HTTP retry policy wrapping around a HTTP get async. Sorry, this is a tiny little bit awkward to use. And then you make your request and get back your response. That's all you have to do at the point of your request with Poly. Very, very light. You do need to define that policy ahead of time. And what this policy says is that it's a retry policy and it's checking if you get a, a status code that's not a success or if you get an exception. If you get either of those, it will retry up to three times. So this is easy to use. It's easy to reuse, and it's easy to change. But if you're in the .NET Core 2.1 or later oh, click, world, you don't even need to wrap your request. That is the code you would have before you use Poly where you're executing your request, and that is the code you would have after using Poly where you execute your request. That's because of the, the magic of HTTP Client Factory, which I'll come to a little bit later. When I started learning about Poly, and particularly when I was working on the Pluralsight course, I was doing quite a bit of research on resilience frameworks. What does it mean? I couldn't find any definition out there, so this is what I came up with. It's that sometimes it is possible to recover, so if you can, you do. That might be a retry or something else. And sometimes it's not possible, so you should degrade gracefully. That could mean different things to everyone. That could mean failing fast, it could mean shedding load, it could mean throttling. It, it's very dependent on you. And again, those things will help both uh, the applications you depend on and the things that depend on you. So I'm going to keep saying that throughout this because with Poly, it doesn't help only your own application, it helps those around you as well. Poly is made up of two sets of strategies. The first are reactive. These things respond to problems that are happening. And as we talked about, the most popular one is retry. So a retry retries immediately when there's a failure. Then you have a wait and retry, which puts in a little bit of a delay. The circuit breaker, which will cut the connection between your application and an application that's failing. And then finally, the fallback, which will attempt to return some sort of meaningful default when possible. Again, that's very context specific. It can also perform an action like maybe page someone or scale out or anything that you need. On the other side, so reactive strategies are those. And then you have proactive strategies. These attempt to monitor ongoing events, and events excuse me, and stabilize your system. The first one is the timeout. This allows you to specify when something should timeout rather than the default. So HTTP client is a perfect example. I think it's 100 seconds. You can say, that's too long. I'm going to timeout much, much sooner. Caching. You can store a previous response with HTTP client. You could store the whole HTTP response, or you could store the business data. So then you don't need to reach out to a remote system. And then finally, bulkhead isolation. This protects the resources within your application by cordoning off how much any particular part of your application can consume, helping stabilize your whole application. At the heart of Poly are policies. They're made up of two things, a handles clause and a behavior clause. The handles clause says, I am handling a 401 or a 500 or a something. And then the behavior says what I'm going to do. That could be retry. It could be uh, something else. All the policies are written in a fluent style, easy to work with. 
they are thread safe, they can be used, the same policy can be used multiple times at the same time. Reusable across your application. You can choose to execute, <coughs> excuse me, a delegate during, a, during a, a poly execution. So the likes of retries has an on retry. So you could do something as before, excuse me, before the retry is executed. And works with both synchronous and async code. And then finally, wrapping. A policy can be wrapped around another policy. So you could have uh, the HTTP request being called by, being protected by the retry, and around that you could be wrapping a fallback. So then you would retry a number of times. If they all fail, the fallback will kick in and give you something. For the rest of this talk, I'm going to be coming back to this little slide. I'm trying to build up a picture of how I use Poly to build fault-tolerant applications. And this little blob represents my application. And what I'm going to try to do is show you how to add robust requests to your application so that in the event of a problem, you'll be able to perform some sort of retry. In the event that there is no communication or something gone wrong with a remote system, that you'll always get some kind of response. That you can cut your connection between your application and a faulting remote application. That you can fail much quicker rather than waiting for a slow failure. Always better to fail fast than slow. How you can reduce load on your own application and remote applications. And then finally, how you can protect your own application's resources from, or sorry, from one part of your application from bringing down the whole application. Tiny little bit about how basic requests work. With HTTP client, you make your request, you can check if it's a success, and then you'll return your response. With the likes of a retry policy, what happens is you make your request, you'll check if there's a success. If it wasn't, the retry policy will kick in. It will check whether or not it should become active in its handles clause. So if you're only checking for, let's say, 401s or something, and you get a 500, it won't become active. But if you're checking for both, it will become active, and then it will kick off another request. It will again check if it was a success. If it was, you'll get the response, a typical HTTP response, unaltered, nothing changed. Poly doesn't pollute it in any way. If instead you got a failure, then Poly lets it flow through and you get back your 401 or your 500 or whatever. But again, it still looks exactly like a standard HTTP response. So timeout, excuse me, uh, retries are probably the most popular thing you're going to use and get the most bang for your buck. But a retry has this problem. You could end up hammering a remote system with retries especially if you're going to retry 10 times or an infinite number of times. If, you've, if you're communicating with a struggling system, retrying quickly isn't necessarily the right thing to do. You're only going to overload the remote system, and you yourself are going to be holding on to multiple open uh, sockets, memory, uh, threads, and the whole lot. Instead, we're going to use maybe the, uh, the wait and retry. You'd send your request, and through a little bit of lambda, you can specify you want to delay for two seconds the first time. And then maybe four seconds the second time. And maybe eight seconds, 16 seconds, some sort of exponential back off. And, or you can choose any algorithm you want for that back off. The thing that a lot of people advocate for are putting in a little jitter as well, so that you would put I don't know, uh, 20, uh, some random number between 10 milliseconds and 100 milliseconds, because you don't necessarily want a lot of your processes retrying at the exact same time. Ethernet does something like this when it's doing its backoffs when, from collisions. How a retry policy looks is like this. I'm going to bring my dot up. So I'm saying I'm looking for anything other than a success code and then I would retry up to three times. And I'm specifying that I'm going to be examining HTTP responses. And then this is what a, a wait and retry looks like. So very, very similar. The difference is down here. 
I'm specifying three retries, and that's my little bit of code to say how long. And that's obviously customizable to anything you want. Let me show you something a little bit different. With .NET Core 2.1, you're probably going to want to use the lower syntax here because you're going to use a registry along with HTTP Client Factory, and the registry passes out iAsync policies depending on the request. I'll cover it a little bit later. This is only a tiny reminder. This is probably what you're going to use, but for the rest of the talk, I'm going to show you the more readable one because it's easier to explain that I'm working with a retry policy or a circuit breaker or whatever rather than using iAsync, but something to, to consider. I mentioned earlier that you can execute a delegate when you are performing a retry. So a good example would be if you're getting an unauthorized back, there's absolutely no point in retrying the exact same request because that's what Polly will do. It'll send the same request with the same credentials three times, four times, five times. Instead, here, you, you're checking if it's a success code. If it's not, you have your little delegate here which checks the particular code that you got. And if it is an unauthorized, you would go and execute some custom logic Maybe you're updating a Josh or updating a cookie or doing something with Okta. So this allows you the ability to execute some arbitrary code prior to the retry. Again, no point in trying a retry with uh, an unauthorized if you're not changing something. The general structure of policies and how they behave is the request occurs, you check the, whether it's a success, and then Polly checks whether or not it's going to trigger its behavior clause. And if it does, it takes some action. I wanted to show that as a, a more general thing. And again, it doesn't interfere with the request. And um, Dylan, the gentleman who made this, has done a lot of work to examine the metrics. And he's found that it's a tiny, tiny impact on the overall time of requests to use Polly. Even if Polly is not becoming active 99% you know, of the time, it doesn't impact in any significant way the, the length of time of your requests. Poly only gets involved when there's a failure. But something that was pointed out to me at a previous conference was I didn't mention that Poly can also be used for things other than HTTP client. So in the top example, I'm checking the int to see if a number is what I expect, and if it's not, I perform a retry. In the middle one, I'm checking a, an enum, and the bottle one, I'm simply checking for an, ex, uh, excuse me, an exception. So if you're not that interested in HTTP client, Polly is still perfectly usable for you. All right, so I'm gonna come back to my little blob here. And now we've added robust requests. So we've got retries, wait and retries. So our application is becoming a little bit more resilient. Fallback is policy usually that you use at the very end of a wrapping. So you may do a retry, a circuit breaker, and a fallback. It's your kind of last line of defense. It allows you, again, as I said a little earlier, to return some sort of meaningful default. May not be applicable in a lot of scenarios. Sometimes it will be. There's also an on fallback delegate, like the on retry I showed you a moment ago, and it can perform any action you like, you know, paging someone, restarting a computer, scaling out, something of that nature. How it looks is like this. So I'm making it easy, I'm making it clear it's a fallback policy. This time I'm using a slightly different way of checking the status code. I'm specifying an internal server error. And here, I am returning a full HTTP response where I'm passing in some cached piece of data because I feel that cached piece of data is applicable to return. So you can build up full HTTP responses and return them uh, instead of the failure you got from a remote system. That's all there is to the caching. Circuit breaker is a very interesting one. Circuit breakers are like what you'd find in your home. In the US, I think we call them circuit breakers. In Ireland, we used to call them trip switches. 
And there are two kinds in poly, an original circuit breaker and an advanced circuit breaker. I'll cover them in a sec. Circuit breakers have three states. The closed state is the normal operation state. Like an electrical circuit, when it's closed, electricity flows, everything works. The open state, like again, like an electric circuit, nothing will flow in the open state, so that's the faulting state. And then the half open state is a test state. When in half open, the first request true is viewed as a test request. If it succeeds, then the circuit becomes uh, closed again. I'll show you this on a state diagram. So it starts in the closed, normal operation. You start your application, you've got a closed circuit breaker, everything is flowing nicely. You start to get some problems, your circuit breaker will open. You now will not be able to communicate with the remote system that's covered by the circuit breaker or the remote endpoint or whatever you've decided to cover by it. After a specified period, let's say 60 seconds, the next request that comes to you that you're going to forward on to a remote system will be a test request. It moves to the half open. If, it's, if it fails, the circuit pops back to the open and it'll be another 60 seconds before you'll be able to communicate with that remote system. You'll then switch back to half open again. If that request succeeds, you go back to closed and back to normal operation. So closed is where you want to be. When in the open state, if a request comes in that's going to try to go across that circuit, Poly will immediately send a failure uh, exception. So it, it times, excuse me, it, it fails immediately. Again, we're back to failing fast rather than failing slow. So there's no wasted time. The thing that you receive the request from is informed that the circuit's open, try later. So you're not holding connections, you're not holding memory, they're not holding anything either. So again, it has that downstream impact, and then of course you've taken load off of the upstream, which is hopefully given time to recover. This is kind of how you might use it. So your application is there on the left, and maybe you've got multiple endpoints on three or four remote applications. You can place a circuit breaker across a single endpoint, potentially a group of endpoints, maybe even all your outbound requests, though that would be a little strange. You know, that would suggest you've got major networking problems that you probably should look at. One slightly different thing about a circuit breaker than the others, what I said about retries and all those is that they're independent, you can run them, a hundred of them at the same time. With a circuit breaker, you want the state to be shared across all uses. So, if in this case you had a failure on the top one and then the bottom one and then the middle one and then the top one, you'd like that to count as four failures or three failures or five failures rather than as one, 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 one or something like that. You want to keep that aggregate going. There is some ongoing work at the moment on distributed circuit breakers, but it's not done yet. So the idea is that right now that count of the number of failures is kept on your process. But if you've got a container and 100 containers, it would be useful if that count was kept in some other location so that you would be able to get an, an aggregate across all. There are, I mentioned, two kinds of circuit breakers. So this is the original circuit breaker. It's, oh, wrong button. So it's saying that if you get two consecutive failures, it's going to time out for 60 seconds. And then you've got these delegates which you can use for logging or for other behaviors but it's two consecutive failures in a window. This is good for some scenarios, but it's been found that it is a little bit um, not, not fine-tuned enough. So they developed an advanced circuit breaker. So this one looks at a rolling average over a period of time as long as you've hit a certain threshold of requests. So what this one says is if you get 50% of failures, in a 30 second window, and you got at least seven requests, then break the circuit for 60 seconds. So it's much more uh, fine grained and tunable. Now both are good. I've had more use from this one because um, we tended to have very little traffic. So I might get a request at the start of an hour and a request at the end of an hour, 
and I don't really want to cut the circuit because I got two consecutive requests that happen to be 60 minutes apart. All right, coming back to my little diagram. So I've added the ability to cut a circuit. So to, to kind of cover it again, the circuit breaker allows you to cut your connection to a remote system. If it's struggling, there's no point communicating with it. You will also help the downstream that are making requests to you by timing out very quickly or by failing quickly. So this, those were all the reactive strategies. So we had retry, the wait and retry, the circuit breaker, and the fallback. I mentioned briefly earlier that you can combine these. So at the this is called a policy wrap. At the center, you would have your HTTP request. Around it, you might retry up to three times. Around that, you might have a circuit breaker in the event that the retries have failed repeatedly. And then finally, around that, if everything has failed, the circuit's open, you've had a ton of failures, you can return some sort of default. You can wrap these in any order you want, but the order is very important. If you instead had the circuit breaker outside the HTTP request and then the retry, it would behave significantly differently. So bear in mind, the order is quite important. All right, this is where we are at the moment, reactive covered. I'm going to move on to a very quick demo. I'm going to use my own computer to simulate a local system and a remote system. The local one will receive a request it's going to call the remote one, and then we're going to see how policies kick in and perform retries. So give me one sec to switch screens. Uh, bum, bum. Do I need to do duplicate? That looks right. So again, on the left, uh, oh, actually, sorry, I'm sorry. Let me do this a different way. I'm sorry. It would be better. <coughs> boom, boom, boom. There we go. That looks OK. So on the left, I have what I'm kind of calling my local system, which has poly to, make, to protect my requests. And on the right, I have a remote system that's going to fail a lot. So the first demo I'm going to run is a plain, simple retry. And what you'll see is that. So in that very, very short period, my local system was hit with a request. Ooh. Oh, my pointer doesn't work now. My local system, I'm going to use my mouse. My local system hit with a request. It sent it to the remote system. That returned an internal server error. This got it, performed a retry very quickly. The remote system again failed, retried, failed, and on the fourth attempt, the remote system worked and I got my response. I'll, show, I'll run it again to show you the speed. So that's how quickly retries work. Now, that's fine in some scenarios, but you can see how that's going to hammer a remote system. The second demo Again, I'm sending a request to my local, to, my, to the one on the left, is going to execute a wait and retry. A little bit more uh, gradual. So you can see, hopefully you can see, the retries one, two, and three, I'm delaying a little bit longer each time, giving that remote system a more time to recover. So if you're dealing with a transient network outage, this is much more likely to work for you than the first one. And then finally, I'm going to show a wrapped request where there's a wait and retry wrapped by a fallback. The remote system this time is going to fail 100% of the time rather than working at the very last request. So in this case, where's my mouse? It failed. Oh, I'm sorry. I hit, uh, oh, uh, I apologize. I sent, I did the wrong demo. Yes, yeah, that says demo tree, I'm sorry. So this time, all four requests will fail. So you'll see the fourth one failing. 
Where is my mouse? It's again doing the wait and retry, so it takes a little bit longer. So this fourth request also failed, and my fallback, that wrap, returned the default of zero, which in this case was meaningful. Uh, it may not be meaningful in your examples or in your cases. So that is the basic usage of retry, wait and retry, and fallback. I am going to try to switch back to my PowerPoint. Oh, it's on the wrong screen. Uh, give me a sec, I'm sorry. Hey, there we go. Oh, so the poly, uh, so that, I'm kind of done with the demos. It's, it's, it's hard to show you enough code that makes sense. It's a little bit easier to give you an example of how quickly it works or how slowly things, the, re, how, the difference between a retry and a wait and retry and then the wraps. I'm going to move on a little bit to what's called a poly registry. So I'm kind of in between the reactive strategies and the proactive strategies. This falls a little outside of both. A poly registry is pretty much a dictionary where you store policies. You can access them via a name or an index. Usually it's better to access them via a name. You can use the registry with dependency injection to pass it around your application. So if you're building a web API application, it would make sense to pass the registry into your controller in pre.NET Core 2.1. So this is a grouping of <coughs> policies. Of course, the registry is as reusable as a policy, but with the HTTP client factory, it's much more tightly integrated. So uh, if you can move to .NET Core 2.1, some of these things will be a little bit easier. So how it looks is like a little box of policies. And you can have as many as you want, either individual policies or wraps of policies. All right, HTTP Client Factory. Has anyone used HTTP Client Factory yet? Wait, great, Steve has used it. The this is something that's come out with .NET Core 2.1. There's been a lot of talk about some of the problems with a traditional HTTP client over the years. I'm only going to touch on them because Steve Gordon is going to have a, a talk after this with much more detail. The main problems were around how long a HTTP client could live. You could keep one around for a very long time, which meant that it would never update IP addresses of remote hosts, or you could keep it around for a very short time, which meant you could face socket exhaustion. So the, so the HTTP client factory has solved the lifetime by, I think it's a two minute life, Steve? Sorry? About two, two minutes, thank you. So a HTTP client will live two minutes before it's recycled out of the pool if it's not in use. And it also will renew your DNS entry. And HTTP client is very tightly integrated with poly. So as, as .NET Core 2.1 was coming out, there was a lot of work going on between Dylan and the, uh, the Microsoft team. What it looks like, if you were to look at the HTTP client factory with a single policy is, you have your services collection as you usually do. Your HTTP client factory goes into it like anything else that you would use for dependency injection. And then you would have potentially a single policy, but you can also use it with a poly registry. So you could have 20 policies. And then you choose between those policies with a little piece of code. And you're, you can choose between them based on maybe the verb, the URL, or some other criteria. So if you know that it's a get, retry and wait and retry are probably OK. But if it's a post, it might not be so good to retry it. How the code looks is a little bit involved. So this is a traditional services collection where you'd set it up. Uh, you have to have a registry defined. Then this is the code to set up the HTTP client factory. And what I'm adding here is I'm telling it what method I'm going to use to perform the selection. When a request occurs, it hits your client factory, creates a client, then looks at this and determines which policy is using 
I'm discriminating based on the verb. So if it's a get, I'm going to use a retry. If it's a post, I'm going to use a no op. I don't want to do a retry. I don't want to do anything else. And if it's anything else, I would use a wait and retry. But as I said, you could check the HTTP request message for the URL or for some other criteria and pick a policy out of your registry based on pretty much any type of criteria that you wish. And here is a plug for Steve. So right after this, room for a lot more information on HTTP Client Factory. Another thing I didn't cover at one of the presentations was testing, and a lot of people like their testing. Uh, two things you generally want to test. How your code behaves if poly were not in place, and you do that with a no-op policy. So you would inject a no-op instead of a retry, for example. Or how your code would behave if poly were to throw an exception, like a broken circuit or a timeout rejected. And you would do that with mocking. There are some examples in my blog on how to do that. All right, I'm going to come back to my kind of story. So this is where we were. We're getting our robust requests, our guaranteed responses, and we're able to cut our circuits to remote systems. So that's all of the reactive policies. Let's move on to the proactive. So proactive monitor your application as it is running. They're, they're, they're looking at, um, sorry, excuse me, they're looking to stabilize your application or potentially allow it to fail more gracefully. And as I said earlier, failing gracefully is it's up to you to decide what that means. The first of these is the timeout. So this lets you choose when, a, in the case of a HTTP client, when the request should end, as opposed to the default that you get out of the box from Microsoft. So the default from Microsoft is, I believe, 100 seconds. Waiting around that long is going to be bad for you and bad for everyone else. Caching. Again, as I said earlier, it allows you to store that response that you've got. And it could either be the full request or just the business data. Um, if you're storing the full request, that's fine, but it might be a little bit too much. Yes? Sorry, can you use the timeout with non-HTTP code? Yeah, but it would you know, it has to be something that would make sense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, all these policies can be used with anything. So sorry, if someone didn't hear me, the gentleman was asking if you can use a timeout with non-HTTP. And yes, you can use it with an entity framework request, a DNS, an Azure request, pretty much anything that it would make sense to use it with. And then finally, the, on the proactive side, we have the bulkhead isolation. That prevents your application from going completely down if some part of it is struggling. All right, covered them in a tiny bit of detail. So if you make a request and it goes unanswered, it will eventually time out, but Microsoft, like I said, determined 100 seconds. Other things, maybe uh, Entity Framework, I don't know what the timeout is, but it's probably not very fast. But you know that if your request isn't back in half a second, two seconds, it's probably dead. So you shouldn't wait around. You shouldn't hold on to the thread, you shouldn't hold on to the memory, you shouldn't hold on to the socket. Those are all expensive resources that you're going to be holding on to. So that the time I mentioned. So the poly timeout allows you to specify a timeout for any given request. It can be used inside a wrap as well. If you if you specify the timeout in this case of oh I'm sorry, of one second, and you don't get a response in that one second, the policy will throw a timeout rejected exception, which it will then pass on to whatever called it. In the testing, frame, sorry, for the testing, that would be one of the examples where you'd be able to mock out um, a timeout rejected exception for, for your unit tests. I believe that is about all there is to the timeouts. The timeouts are very, very simple, one parameter. But you, know, you, you have to think about what makes sense as that parameter, how long it should be. So there, our application is failing, or excuse me, is, is becoming a little bit more robust. So caching is a little bit tricky. Um, it was pointed out to me a little while ago about caching a full response. You can have problems if you try to reread a stream. That's something you need to consider. If you are going to reread a stream, you will have to reset your pointer. But I've found that in most cases, 
you'll get back uh, a fresh stream at a starting point. You can also, as I said, cache just the business data. So it's very, it, it's hard for me to give advice because it's very specific to your own scenario. Ca um, you can use a cache policy in multiple places. So you could have one part of your code that makes the request and then 10 other parts that potentially make a similar request and they can fetch it from the cache instead. The cache works off of a traditional Microsoft cache or a distributed cache, you can use either. And it has the usual uh, things like an on cache get, an on cache miss, put, error, and so on. Find the cache. Oh yeah. So in your code, it, the cache is a little bit more complicated to set up and I think they changed some stuff recently so it still feels a little bit tricky. Uh, inside your configure services, you pass in your service collection, you add your memory cache, then you add your async provider with a memory cache provider. In this place, you could have a distributed memory cache if you're using Redis or something of that nature. Then you're specifying your policy for your cache and how long it should live. So I'm saying I'm using the in-cache memory. I'm sorry, in-memory cache, I apologize. You have to have this, this context. This, to me, this feels a tiny bit awkward, but this is how it works. The context is the unique way of identifying the entry that, where, where the cached value is going to go. So if you're making a request to a, a remote system, you need to uniquely identify each of those responses. So in this case, to get inventory by ID, I'll include the ID. If I was requesting a catalog, I would have to set up another context to do that. Then you would use, a ca so cache policy, I think executes only this way. I don't think it works as well with the HTTP client factory. Be, yeah, I'm right. It was. It, it, it's easier to use it this way than to try and use it transparently. So you'll notice there's a difference here. I'm doing the cache policy, execute async, and then the HTTP client. The reason is I need this context here passed in here at the time of execution. So to me, this one feels like the most difficult or awkward to use. Um, I have a feeling that they are working on it, but it's very useful, but a tiny little bit more difficult. Oops, sorry, one sec. All right, so that is, we've reduced our load. So the big thing as well with reducing the load is you're now not calling that remote system. You've stored your value locally. You're able to respond far faster and maybe more reliably, and the system that's calling you will get a valid response. Now you have to, of course, figure out how long you should store that value for them. And again, that's not something that's necessarily easy to determine. And if you're using a distributed cache, you have to deal with the vagaries of that. This is what could happen to your application if you can't handle all the incoming requests. Has anyone, you know, has anyone ever had an application that its own code was fine, but was overloaded maybe due to some downstream? Anyone? One, one, two, three, four, okay. We've, we've had a few. So you're, if, you're getting, if you're being bombarded with incoming requests, your memory will get used up, all your threads will potentially get used up, all your outgoing sockets will get used up. And this could all be caused by maybe one small part of your application. So this one part that is being overloaded is beginning to fail, it's taking up all the memory, it's taking up all the sockets, and your whole application goes down. And this is where the bulkhead isolation policy comes in. So the term comes from the nautical world. In larger ships, you have bulkheads which section off areas. So if one part is breached, water will flood in, but it hopefully won't be able to get to another part. So you could put a hole in the side of a ship uh, and you hopefully don't sink. If you were to kind of consider how this looks um, on an example, you'd have your local system making requests to some remote system. So again, think of the upstream and downstream. <coughs> 
I'd make one request. I don't get a response, I make another request. I get one response, but now I still have one outstanding request. I might make a third request and a fourth request, and I get back now only two. So I've got two outstanding requests. Now I've got three outstanding requests. So I'm holding the memory, the threads, the sockets, and so on. And eventually, that local system will go down. There is, it's almost, let's say, unavoidable. What, how the bulkhead isolation works is, your application, I'm calling it the catalog service. The bulkhead isolation has two features, an execution slot and a queue slot. Execution slots are, as they sound, where it will execute requests and you would specify some fixed number of execution slots. When they're full, any other requests that you want to make will go into a queue slot. So let's say you get some incoming requests. The first three go into the execution slot, so they, they're executing right now. All is good, your application is still fine and stable. You get a bunch more requests. So let's say you're still executing the first three. You've taken six more that are sitting in a queue. They're not executing, so they're holding on to a little bit of memory. You get one more request. There's nowhere for it to go. Execution is full. Queue is full. What will happen is your, app, your code will return, a, ooh, me, it will return a failure immediately to the caller. So they're not waiting around. They've been told, sorry, I cannot handle your request. You should try later. So now what you're doing is you're shedding load. You're saying, I'm too busy. Talk to me some other time. But you're saying it very, very quickly. So again, from the downstream perspective, you fail quickly. They're not hoping for a response that they're not going to get. And your upstream is also potentially not being overloaded because you're only executing th up to three requests at a time. When one of your execution slots completes, you got your response back, you're happy with it, it didn't fail, you're not retrying, a request will move from your queue into your execution slot. I showed this slide to my wife at some point, and uh, she's somewhat technical. And she said to me, queues don't work like that. You can't go from some random place to some other random place. But it's fine, but I didn't want to change it. This slide took hours. <laughs> Then you get another incoming request, and now you have a queue slot available again, and you're happy. At this point, again, you're full. Any further request would cause a fast failure, um, but you would not become overloaded. You're holding on to only three ongoing requests. You're holding on to a little bit of memory, three sockets, three threads. Your application will remain stable. Now, that's for, you know, let's say, a single small part of an application. I'll show you what it might look like on a bigger application in a sec. But first, a quick look at the code. And it's very, very simple. This is my bulkhead isolation policy. So here I'm showing the IASync policy. I could have specified bulkhead async. I'm saying three execution slots and six queue slots. And then execute some arbitrary code if I want to when I get a rejected. So I mentioned I'm going to show you what it might look like for, let's say, a full, much, much bigger application. So let's pretend you've got 100% of resources available. Let, you know, 100 of whatever is available, I'm going to set it at 100. You might have, I don't know, 10 parts of your app, no, what have I got? You might have 12 parts of your application that are going to accept requests and try to hold on to resources and not let the whole application come down. So it may look something like this. You've got multiple places that are building up bulkheads, taking incoming requests, cordoning off memory, threads, sockets, and let's say you won't go any further. So at this point, your application hopefully will not go down. Now, you can have as many bulkheads as you want in an application. This is a pretty advanced uh, policy 
I haven't used it, and I think, has anyone in the room used Bulkhead? Nope. So it's, it is very powerful, but it's, I, I don't see it in use as much. Let me see if I have anything else on that. Nope. All right, so that was the last of the things we needed for our application. So it has become a lot more fault tolerant. You have your robust, I'm oh, sorry, did I have a question? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so you have your robust request with your retries. You have your fallbacks for guaranteed responses. Your circuit breaker, if you want to cut your connection. Timeouts to fail more quickly. Caching to reduce load. And then finally, bulkhead isolation to protect resources and prevent your whole application from going down. What is coming soon for Poly? Our custom policies, so you won't be limited to the, the, the ones that come out of the box. You'll be able to write your own. I don't know how they're doing this, because the policies that they have at the moment have been heavily, heavily overloaded. And that's been one of the difficulties they've had with advancing the project. So when you can build custom policies, they must have come up with something much, much uh, simpler. Something else they're going to bring in is something kind of like the Chaos Monkey. So you've probably heard of Netflix killing services here and there. So this was something that, for a resilience framework, it feels a tiny bit strange to me, but they're now going to have policies that allow you to inject failures or problems or delays into requests. And you can do this for unit tests, or you can do it in production systems if you wanted to. And they have a variety of them available. Another big thing that they have been working on for quite some time, uh, at least a year, is telemetry. So it's hard at the moment to figure out how your application is behaving with regard to poly. Your, for example, a retry could be so good at hiding a problem that you don't even know that you're making three requests to a remote system to get back a single response. You could do it by hand with a delegate, the on retry delegate, where you could do some manual logging out to, to some uh, store. But I have, I, I have a friend who was using Poly, and they were using it, and it, as I said, it was, using, it was working so well, they didn't even know that the remote system was having problems. But that's not good, because you're now hiding a failure rather than finding out about it. So the telemetry is coming, and the idea will be that it's transparent, and then it will feed into any of the popular dashboards, which I can't remember the name of it at the moment, but it's, it's going to be one of those kind of generic ones that will feed anything that's suitable. The other big one that people have been asking for is a distributed circuit breaker, and I mentioned that a little while ago. The idea of you've got 100 containers communicating with some dodgy remote system, you're getting failures across the 100 containers periodically, but not enough to trigger a circuit breaker on any of them, but if you were to aggregate all of those failures, it would. But it's not the easiest thing to come up with, a distributed count that's synchronized and updatable by 100 things at the same time. That is pretty much what's coming. If you want some more information, uh, you can check out my Pluralsight course. It's published a year ago. It covers primarily dot, it covers primar it does cover .NET Core. The mo most of it is uh, suitable for .NET Core pre-2.1, and then I added a module on HTTP Client Factory for .NET Core 2.1. I have a lot of examples of uh, different features of Poly, um, how to use it, and it's all code. So one of the things in my blog is there's always a zip file with a full solution. You can download it, open it, run it. It will work, I'm almost certain. So one of the things that annoyed me when I was looking at blogs was snippets of code without using statements, without NuGet packages. So that's why I did it that way. There is a very active Slack channel. I'm on it, Steve's on it, Dylan's on it. There's a getting help channel. There's a sorry, getting started, the general channel. There's probably one on distributed circuit breaker. And I bet you there's, I haven't been on it in a little while, but there's probably some ones on the new features, particularly the chaos engineering. There is the open uh, repository, and Dylan is always looking for contributions. 
Uh, he's based here in the UK, very approachable, very nice guy. Um, I think he's also starting a side uh, repository for contributions to Polly. And they also have their own blog. And that, folks, is my presentation. Thank you very much. I'm about five minutes early, so if anyone wants to ask me anything, I'm happy to answer. <laughs>